Marley and Zeb and Soraya and thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by saying Watami. That's my direct language word for I see you. We don't say we don't have a word for hello or a word for goodbye. Um, but it's lovely to be here again on Ghana country, all the way from my home country, which is uh, the western suburbs of Sydney. So if you've heard of the Blue Mountains down to Bondi Beach, um, that's our Darug country there. And really excited um, to be here, so thanks for having me. I'd also love to shout out to Port Lincoln High School for hosting um, my colleague Tiari and I. So, woo, um, Port Lincoln High School, where are you? <laughs> woo, thank you. Um, and I'd also like to do a big shout out to the Yasta team from Port Lincoln High, High School. Um, Tyson Retallick, Kobe Saunders, Ella Cox and Taylor David Mabura. Thank you so much for having us. You guys do a wonderful job. Big round to all the, um, the amazing Yatsa team who bring this fantastic event together for everyone. Okay, so I'm 44 years old. So old, I know, so ancient. I remember looking at 44-year-olds when I was your age and just be like, oh my God, they're gonna die soon. They're so old. Um, but I'm happy to say at 44, I have an amazing life. Um, I have been able to be a National Parks Ranger in the Great Barrier Reef. I spent eight years diving on the Great Barrier Reef and flying around in helicopters, chasing whales, dugongs and turtles. Um, I then got to go and live in Western Australia and um, has anyone heard of whale sharks before? <laughs> yes! Are they whales or are they sharks? <laughs> They're sharks. Um, so yeah, I got to hang out in the Pilbara for a couple of years chasing whale sharks around as a marine biologist. Um, then I got to go up to Kakadu, up to the very top of Australia on Bini Mongoi country and learn all about the tropical north, mozzies. Um, nah, it was beautiful country up there and I had an amazing, amazing time connecting with Bini Mongoi mob who so generously shared their culture with me. And it was when I was on Kakadu country that I decided we needed to change the way that we tell our cultural stories in national parks. And I decided that I might build an app and I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I had no money, because I know, you got, if you guys know, park rangers don't earn very much money. <laughs> um, so uh, I decided that we needed to just try and see if we could use this new technology called augmented reality to uh, allow people to visit our places and you'd hold your phone up and a holographic image of an elder or a creation figure would pop up and tell you the right story at the right time and the right place for the right reasons in the right language um, and that we would build a business model around that. And that's what I really want to talk to you guys about today is the, it STEM in the context of bringing culture into STEM or STEM into culture um, and also around business. Um, so I mentioned I have an amazing life today. I'm no longer a park ranger, sad face. Um, I do love being a park ranger, but I had to uh, stop being a park ranger so I could grow a company. And being a CEO of a business um, was not something that was ever on my bingo card. Um, I failed school, so I got 36 out of 100 for my tertiary entrance rank. <laughs> I had to go to TAFE to try and do my uh, high school certificate so I could get into an environmental biology degree. Um, I did all right the second time around and then had to go and do summer school um, to get my chemistry up to scratch, which I then failed at uni three times. Um, but eventually I got my environmental biology degree. Um, so I did. I did have a hard time um, going through the education system, but here I am today as a CEO of a company. Um, so what do, I, what do we do it in digital? So we want to bridge the digital skills divide between mob and non-mob. So our mob sometimes don't have the best opportunities to get involved in holographic content production or gaming and animation or um, yeah, any of those amazing new technologies that are coming out that allow you to not just look at the internet through a screen, but allow you to be in the internet. 
um, and to have the internet be in the real world as well. Um, so I get to help build what's called the metaverse. I know people haven't really decided what this next version of the internet's going to be called yet, um, but it's you might have heard the terms of metaverse. I mean, Facebook changed its name to meta, so it could dominate in that area. Um, it's also called the spatial web, but basically what it means is you'll have holograms um, popping up all around you in the real world, which you'll experience through glasses um, or through your phones, and that will give you like context of where you are. Um, so as a 44-year-old woman, I get to play Minecraft a lot. I get to uh, build holograms with elders and kids all across Australia. Um, I work with the biggest brands in the world. <laughs> Um, which is Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, Nike, really small, don't know if you've heard of them. Um, I get to travel the world with other First Nations people and go to places like the United Nations in New York and in Geneva to advocate for our First Nations digital rights because I feel that we have a really long way to go to make sure that when we're putting our culture into these new technologies that it's owned by us and that it's protected by us and that our mobs have the opportunity to grow our own businesses from our knowledge systems. Um, and then I get to work with my sister. Everyone says don't work with animals and sisters or brothers and I've done both of those things. It's okay. Um, working with my sister has been um, such an amazing experience over the last three years and it does work working with family. So don't be scared of that if that opportunity ever comes up. Um, and I work with a group of amazing people. There's 10 of us in the company now. Um, we're 90% women, 80% um, First Nations. Uh, we have a couple of amazing allies that work with us um, to do this work. And I also get to, um, I've been working with Minister Ed Husick and the Diversity in STEM review team this year to look at how can Australia better make sure that our mob are not left behind when it comes to STEM and STEM careers. So I want you to keep an eye out. Um, is, you know, if you don't follow politics, and you might not see it in, in, your, in your world, but please do look out maybe next week, maybe the week after for the review report. It'll be an opportunity for you to put your submission into maybe change how we do STEM in this country. So please, please, please. I want loads of mob getting on there and telling the government how we should do this better. Um, because of these, th these things and um, my feeling of being whole now in the work that I do, I attribute them to three things which I wanted to share today. Um, very first is connection to country and to culture is a superpower. Um, relationships with my mob, other mobs and allies, and if you can have the same relationships too, will get you everywhere. And this concept of reciprocity. And this is the best part of my life right now, um, is the giving back to country and community. So for all the years of all the hard labor, um, I get to help my community shine through the work that we do. Um, but STEM to me isn't about lab coats, beakers, drones, or holograms. Um, it's much deeper than that. And when I think about science, I think about the ways that we know about country from all our ancestors that have walked before us. Like, there's at least 65,000 years of science experiments that our ancestors have done on this country. So Western science has got a little ways to go till they catch up with our knowledge system. Um, I think about technology in the tools that we build and use. Like, I'm not really excited by technology. I work with tech every day. I work with machine learning. I work with holographic headsets. I work with really cool games. Um, but none of that excites me as much as the knowledge systems that our communities can bring into these technologies to further engage not just our mobs but everyone else. Um, I want to see a day where people can put glasses on and walk around country and be, see everything that we see on our country in the way that we see it and that that content is programmed by our mob. When engineering, engineering, people think of bridges all the time when they think about engineering. I don't know what pops into your head, but yeah, I think from the old school days of trying to build matchstick bridges in class um, is how I was taught about engineering. <laughs> But engineering is really just the stuff we make. Um, we have the oldest existing continuously used human built structure in the world on this country and it is the Brewarina fish traps. They're still in operation. Our oldest known 
engineering structure in the world. Like that's pretty significant and special and something we should celebrate. Um, and the last thing in the M in STEM, <laughs> um, I mentioned that I failed maths and chemistry. I'm not really good with numbers, um, but to me, maths is the patterns that we see. Who looks at a patch of four-leaf clovers and finds the four-leaf clover, or just clovers? Can you see them really easily? I've spoken to like thousands of mob across the country, and we are deadly at seeing the four-leaf clover. Our pattern recognition is out of this world, and all algorithms are is pattern recognition and uh, a language to try and find how we make sense of that pattern. So we're already STEM professionals, it's inbuilt into our DNA and we've just got to like put our, our superhero cape on and just go for it. Um, so the connection part, um, I mentioned connection was the number one thing of, of success in STEM. Um, I wasn't culturally raised by my mob, so I mentioned I'm a Darug woman. I descend from the first of the five stolen generation in this country. So my apical ancestor, the ancestor that we can trace back the furthest, was a woman called Fanny, and she was taken by Governor Macquarie um, to be educated in the Natives Institute. Um, and since that time, our community have had, or my direct family have had, um, a lot of stuff happened to us. We've been moved off country for generations and that made it really hard for my mom and then for us to connect. Um, so it wasn't until my early 20s where I actually found and reconnected with my mob. And in that time, I was also being culturally raised by Naro, Birigaba, Yinigadera, um, and Bidding Mongoy. So I'm really grateful to the mobs that were so generous in sharing their knowledge with me um, when I couldn't be connected to my own family. I'm glad to say that I've spent the last 15 years dedicating my life to learning Darug language, um, Darug culture, and connecting up to my family. Um, but if you don't know where you're from and you don't know who your mob is, that's, that's totally fine. It's not our fault. Um, we, we didn't choose that path for ourselves, but we can always find our way home. And I've found living in many, many different nations across Australia that mob will find you and our mob is so generous and they want us to succeed. And I just really beg you, please, just with your open heart, allow yourself to learn from those community members that find you and welcome you into their culture. Um, this will be your life's work as a First Nations scientist um, and it may not be completed in your lifetime and you have to be okay with that. Um, the second part is relationships. And as an adult, and this might not make sense yet, but hopefully it will soon. Um, you are the sum of every conversation you've ever had. And if we aren't getting anywhere, or we need things to change, or we can't work out why something's broken, the first thing that we need to do is change the conversation we have with ourselves. Um, then we have to change the conversations we have with our family and with our ancestors and our communities. And better conversations come from asking better questions. And I think learning STEM uh, as a subject area equips you to ask amazing questions. If you don't do anything else in STEM but learn how to ask questions, then you are winning. Um, I think I'm gonna give you four questions you can ask and these are like the solution questions that I use every single day in my life and every time something's not working or every time I don't feel like getting out of bed in the morning, which happens. Um, Number one, what are you proud of? I think we need to start with that question every single day. Like, what are we proud of in our lives? There's always something that we have done or that we're proud of our ancestors at least or we're proud of our mob. We need to start our days <laughs> with some positivity and that will change the rest of your day, I promise. The next question that we can ask is, what are we most afraid of? This is a really cross-cutting question because it gets to the, the heart of like, what is your ambition in your life and what do you put on this earth to do? If we're afraid of something, it means we care. And the next thing, if we know what we're afraid of, we need to work out, well, what's the most pressing need to address that fear? What would we do first if we had all the resources in the world to fix the problem or the thing that we're afraid of? And the fourth question is, what can I do to help? What have I got in my home, in my family, in my community, in my bank account, in my networks, in my resources that I can contribute to helping solve this problem. And I think as mob your age, you're really feeling this. 
um, in terms of climate change and we all have agency to, to speak up for country right now, even our little, little, little ones. Um, the last thing I mentioned was reciprocity. And that's really about giving back. And I think a fatal mistake I made in my life was I was trying so hard to connect to who I am and what I needed to do that I waited till the end for reciprocity. And I don't think we should wait till the end. If I had my time again, I would lean into reciprocity and giving back from day one. Um, as I mentioned, country needs us right now and I would dedicate my whole life again into helping country heal and um, be better. Uh, and to be a voice for country. But I do get to give back now. Um, having a, a company that um, we started with $25 and now we do revenue of $1.5 million a year, um, I'm able to give back to my community. And an example of that is we've just sponsored 15 of our elders and knowledge holders to start Harvard today. So. <laughs> They'll be going through um, Harvard to learn about power and positivity and impact, um, as well as bringing along community members that we've seen have exceptional talent in holographic technologies. We've buddied them up with Microsoft. They've created Xboxes with Indigenous art all over them. We've worked with Microsoft Surface devices to put Indigenous artwork all over the Surface devices. They came out this NADOC week. Um, and now we're seeing a lot of the kids we work with really excel in the careers that they want in the way that they want to excel in those careers. Um, so I've got something to share about one last superpower. Um, and this is a kind of a funny and sad story. <laughs> Have you guys seen this before? This is ugly. It is the ugliest animal. It is the stinkiest animal, and it is the hardest animal to find and to get to. And what my ancestors used to do to get this was get a kangaroo bone and fashion it right down into a really skinny hook, and we used to poke it through the hole in the mangroves, and we used to rip the mangrove worm out um, to eat. So uh, this is my totem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I reconnected with my mom, they're like, you're, co you're Cabrigal. I'm like, cool, what is Cabrigal? People of the Cobra Grub. Great, what's a Cobra Grub? Sheepworm. Okay, so it's not actually a grub, it's a mollusk. <laughs> um, but I really understand as a biologist now why our entire tribe was named after this amazing animal and why we should not diss our totem because it is horrendously ugly. Um, it's a very, very important animal. And this is now my favourite animal. I thought I was going to get a whale or an eagle or something really cool, but no. I am stuck as a woodworm. My woodworm changed the course of history. So this is uh, Christopher Columbus's boat in 1500s. Shipworm stopped Christopher Columbus from taking over the rest of the USA by sinking his ship. He was stuck in Jamaica for a year and decided that he would no longer go and explore uh, other lands. So yay for shipworm. I don't know if you've heard of the Spanish Armada and the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Oh yeah, really big story about how the British became uh, the most powerful nation on earth. Uh, they were fighting the Spaniards uh, who, had, who were amazing seamen. Um, and this is what they want you to believe. They went in there and they got all the ships and then they won the war and they became the most powerful nation on earth. Actually, the Spanish were hiding in a harbour for six weeks and that's exactly the amount of time a shipworm needs to eat through the bore and bore through the hull of a ship. So mostly the Spanish Armada was sunk before the British even got there. So yeah, be careful whose science you lean into. So, this was the technical solution in the 1700s to get rid of shipworm. They would clad the ships in copper gilding. So, what do you reckon that did? They thought it deterred shipworm. Oh no, it gave the shipworm a place to hide. Um, so, shipworm would get in behind the copper and because the ship was so beautiful and gold and they took it out to sea. In exactly six weeks, they'd be in the middle of the ocean and the ship would sink. Yay, shipworm. 
They almost got the shipworm in the 70s when they created antifoulance. Um, so basically the solution for shipworm then was to pour toxic chemicals all over the ship. And unfortunately, it did work on the shipworm. However, it also created um, the world's worst marine pollution issue that we have today. Every single port around the world is contaminated with um, nitrates and arsenic and copper from people pouring toxic chemicals all over to get rid of shipworm. <laughs> Um, it's a tragedy and one that I wish that we would cease and desist. Not everyone hated the shipworm, though. Has anyone heard of the River Thames in London? Has anyone been on the London Underground? Oh, it's like being in a can of squished sardines on that London Underground. Like, you're like, they're like that with everyone squished against you. Uh, the, but the tunnel that you travel in was made possible because of shipworm. Um, so, you might have seen in the first very ugly photo of the shipworm, or mollusk, it has jaws and a real squishy body behind them. And what those jaws do is screw into these really hard timbers. And there was a guy uh, who was in the Navy and hated shipworm and spent his whole career trying to kill it until he heard of all the Cornish miners being uh, killed while trying to drill under the Thames River in London. And he was like, hmm, I've seen an animal that does that really well. So he took the, he took the shipworm's shape and design and then designed a boring tunneler, um, which worked out how to build under rivers. So today, the shipworm is how we make tunnels under large water bodies. And my favourite fact about shipworm, because I just love this animal so much, this is a Cynodobacter. This is like the most evil bacteria known to man and woman, humankind. Uh, this is otherwise known as a superbug. Um, so what a superbug is, is it is resistant to uh, all kinds of medicines that we've created to kill bugs. So like Staphylococcus and all the E. coli and all the things that you have antibiotics for. They're starting to outgrow our medicines. Um, but I, I go back to uh, our people being observed eating shipworm in the 1798. There was a man called Watt Content who went up our river and all our mob were dying of smallpox and he saw dead bodies littered all over the banks of the rivers. But he came across uh, our ancestors and he said, I frightened them so much that they left the delicacies of their stomach on the beach. And in that vomit was a bunch of shipworm. Now, our people were eating shipworm because it was the only known medicine that our people had access to to try and stop dying from smallpox. But smallpox is a virus, so shipworm wasn't going to be very good at fixing that. However, we all always knew that it was one of the only species that makes antibiotics. Today, researchers are discovering um, that shipworm is the only thing that's going to kill superbugs. So this amazing animal that's so ugly and so stinky and so disgusting might actually be the saviour of humanity. So I'm going to leave you with that thought. Thank you very much for having me. Lean into your totem and your culture, and uh, yeah, we're all going to be just fine. Thanks.